um, which, um, by the way, um, takes off pretty much where we are leaving you because uh, we mentioned, uh, Lena mentioned um, the various, um, say, more classical um, cryptographic operations that we are having there. And I'm sure that Joe Brennes will tell us a bit more about uh, cryptographic operations that we might not be so familiar with yet. Um, and tell us about how we could use them in an in an embedded context. Just. Yep. Thank you, Christian, for the introduction. Um, you can see my screen, yeah, just to confirm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I'm a cryptographer at NXP Semiconductors. So thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, give this talk. Um, maybe a little preview um, towards the, the, the uh, two nice talks before me. Hopefully, post quantum crypto will not make Lena's life much harder for cryptographic APIs, but I'm fairly certain that Jurgen's life will be a little bit uh, or a lot of bit uh, harder uh, to introduce post quantum crypto. Um, so, Maybe to give a little bit of background on NXP, um, I think many of you will be familiar with, with us already. Um, right, so we're a semiconductor company. Uh, we make integrated circuits, uh, chips, um, you know, that appear yeah, almost everywhere nowadays. Um, so our, our most important markets are uh, automotive. So your modern car has as many chips. Um, IoT, of course, but also more kind of classical domains like um, 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 transit cards, uh, payment terminals, um, uh, mobile phones, of course, as well, um, and maybe your communication infrastructure, so uh, Wi-Fi, 4G, um, and, and ultra-wideband uh, is also an important recent one. Um, okay, and so um, maybe to introduce post quantum crypto, um, many of you might not be familiar with it. Um, so kind of your, your, your modern uh, infra crypto infrastructure is usually divided up into these two paradigms. Um, so you have your public key crypto, uh, so RSA, ECC, elliptic curve crypto. Um, and these are based on your mathematical hard problems. Um, so this is either the difficulty of factoring to the product of two large prime numbers um, or the difficulty of your discrete logarithm or your elliptic curve discrete logarithm. And then there's symmetric cryptography. So these are um, your block ciphers and, uh, and your hash functions and, and related functions. So think AES, um, SHA-2, SHA-3, um, SHA-1, which you're hopefully not using anymore. Um, and where do um, uh, where does the, the term post-quantum come in now? Um, so basically there's kind of a looming threat of a quantum computer. So quantum computing is uh, a domain which many resources are being uh, put into nowadays, your big companies, Microsoft, Google, IBM, are all trying to build a quantum computer, and, and some have uh, succeeded already, um, and they've built uh, your, your small quantum computing uh, computers. And so what is the threat towards cryptography? Well, essentially, um, if you can build a large quantum computer, for some definition of large, um, these will be capable of solving our supposedly hard cryptographic problems. So if you have a large quantum computer, you can run Shor's algorithm, so invented by Shor in 94, um, which is essentially an algorithm that factors uh, a product of two prime numbers or solves an elliptic curve discrete logarithm. Um, and so because these problems will no longer be hard, the crypto that is based on them will, will no longer be secure. Um, and similarly, there's a, another algorithm uh, invented by Grover, um, which reduces the security of your symmetric ciphers. Um, essentially, a very rough estimate would say that um, the AES key size halves in security. So if you're using AES-128, you'd need to, to move to AES-256. Um, and uh, you might also need to increase the output size of your, of your hash functions. So this leads to um, many questions already. Um, I'm not a quantum physicist myself. Um, but there are many questions like, um, you know, when will a quantum computer be large enough to um, attack uh, crypto algorithms? Um, will it ever even be large enough to attack crypto algorithms? Um, and so these are not the questions we're going to answer today. Um, what is happening uh, today um, is that the threat 
of quantum computers is, is very real and is being taken very seriously by um, um, governments mainly um, and by, by academics and, and by many people. Um, but the governments are starting to look into um, the migration from your classical standards, so your digital signature standards for ECC and RSA, um, and how to update and move them to post-quantum standards, um, standardizing so-called post-quantum cryptographic algorithms. So it means a cryptographic algorithm that runs on a, 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 a modern day, a current classical device, um, but is still secure even if an attacker has access to a, a large quantum computer. Um, and so these standards are being uh, developed by organizations such as NIST, um, BSI, ANSI, um, and, and many other governments um, are starting to, to work on this. So maybe to give you a bit of an, an insight into this, these standardization efforts, um, the main driver for this, which has a lot of influence from the, the cryptographic academic community, um, is that by NIST. So it's the, the um, um, U.S. government organization standardizing um, um, yeah, what the, the, the cryptographic algorithms to be used by the American government. Um, and they started already a call for proposals back in 2016. And now in 2021, we are five years later, um, three rounds later, and we are currently in, in round three um, since summer last year. Um, and uh, um, um, basically, um, so at the summer this year, so summer 2021, um, NIST announced that they will end this round uh, by the end of this year. So in, within a couple of months, we will know which algorithms will be selected as winner. So there will be one key encapsulation mechanism. This is kind of what a, what a key exchange algorithm is um, and one digital signature algorithm. Um, standardized, uh, so not standardized, but picked as a winner at the end of this year, and then it will take a couple of years longer, um, maybe two, they estimate, to actually create a draft for the standard and maybe a little while longer before they actually um, uh, publish it. So um, you can think two years is far away, um, but of course, especially for, for companies designing hardware, um, two years is, uh, is actually really little time um, to, to prepare for this. Okay, so kind of what does this competition look like? Um, actually, at the start in round one, there were 69 submissions, so very many. Um, and so now in round three, there are only these left. Um, these are um, 15 submissions. So here in the two black quadrants, um, um, each of these blocks and these, these weird looking names, Crystal Skyber, Saber, and True, they represent a, a submission in round three of this standardization effort. Um, which means that each of these uh, uh, um, um, still has a chance of making it into the, um, the, the final standard. Um, and so this kind of already shows one of the difficulties of preparing for this. Um, if a, a final standard is to be released in two years, um, that is, uh, or two and a half years, um, at this point, we are not even sure uh, which algorithm is going to be standardized at that point, uh, which already makes preparation a little bit more difficult. Um, and so one of the downsides of post quantum cryptography um, is that even though there are so many submissions here, um, there are 15, um, none of them will have uh, or none of them will act as a perfect re replacement for RSA or um, ECC. Um, either your key sizes will increase or your uh, runtime will increase. Um, so you know, depending on your application, um, one of them might fit your application really well. Um, but as a generic solution, uh, a gen generic replacement for RSA and ECC, um, uh, it, it's difficult to, uh, to pick only, only one. Okay, and so um, what, what we are looking into um, is um, the migration from classical crypto to um, post-quantum crypto. And so the, the, you know, one of the driving questions is then, so where is this cryptography actually used? Um, and yeah, I'm happy I had a great talk by Jurgen who talked about secure boot and, and over the air updates. Um, and this is a very important one for us um, because it acts as a kind of root of trust. Um, you can have a very complicated system. It can run many 
uh, crypto in many different places, um, but it's difficult to trust anything on your system if you cannot trust your firmware. Um, and therefore, secure boot um, and over the air updates are a very important uh, and uh, backbone of crypto. Um, this also means that because the migration can be difficult uh, towards post quantum, your, if your system is very complicated, it can, can be a very significant effort. Um, and so, uh, um, secure boot and over the air protocols may be a, a good place to start. Um, so to first only update those, um, which might not impact um, um, uh, yeah, the, your actual system too much since you, you shouldn't be doing this too often, um, but at least it allows you the opportunity um, if quantum computers become more and more of a real threat um, that you allow yourself the opportunity to securely update other features of your system uh, at a later point in time. So this focuses much on, uh, very much on digital signatures. Um, of course, there's also um, uh, key exchange elements. Um, so there's communication between IoT devices, uh, cars, um, um, and, but also trust provisioning is a, is a very important topic. Um, key sizes might actually significantly increase, um, um, which, which impacts all these types of protocols. Okay, so let me make this a little bit more concrete. Um, and I'll start with a um, kind of a positive note. Um, so here, what I did, um, I, I drew a table um, and on the, on the y-axis, I drew four uh, candidates. So on the top is X25519. So it's a, it's a standardized, a NIST RFC standardized uh, elliptic curve key exchange uh, algorithm. Um, and below that, I, I plotted three of the candidate post-quantum key exchange um, uh, schemes. Um, and these numbers are taken from the PQM4 library. Um, you might be familiar with it. So it's a, um, it's a, a cryptographic library maintained by the group of Peter Schwabe. So it's an, it's a, an academic. Um, and he implemented, uh, he and many others implemented um, um, yeah, most of the post-quantum algorithms on the Cortex M4 and created a real nice um, uh, benchmark uh, system around it so that we can really compare um, the algorithms quite well. And so the numbers that you see here are taken from that. Um, and it really shows that, at least in terms of latency, um, that these three uh, algorithms actually do not perform that much worse than elliptic curves, which is um, kind of nice, uh, right? So in, in terms of performance, um, we might be uh, we might be okay. And now the more um, yeah, uh, um, the more negative view on it. Um, so if you look at the actual implementations um, of these schemes, um, what you see is that these are much more memory hungry. Um, so here, instead of the, the cycles, uh, I plotted the, the, the stack usage in bytes on the x-axis and the same algorithms on the y-axis. Um, and you can easily see that the, the number of stack bytes that are being used in Saber and Entru and Kyber is much higher than that used in, in the elliptic curve variant. Now, of course, stack usage is um, very implementation dependent. Um, and so but definitely it's possible to reduce your stack use here um, and maybe reduce it quite a bit, especially if you start sacrificing some performance. Um, but it's really clear that the inherent uh, uh, stack use of these algorithms is much higher than, um, uh, than the elliptic curve variants. Um, and so here, if we only look at stack use, this is already clear. Um, this picture becomes even worse if you start looking at key material um, or, or flash memory uh, requirements. So X25519 will have a 32 byte public key, let's say, um, whereas Saber and True Kyber will have public keys of um, um, ranging from uh, 800 to uh, over 1,000 uh, bytes. Uh, so it's a significant increase in, in your public key size, but also in your, your ciphertext size and also your secret key size. Um, so if you want to implement this on a very low end device, um, you should really expect to run into uh, challenges regarding uh, memory use. Okay, so great, kind of a, um, a related topic. Um, so what you see uh, on very small devices is that uh, these crypto algorithms, RSA and ECC, can be, can be um, um, you know, very uh, resource heavy, so they can be quite slow 
Um, and so one thing you can do um, is you can add uh, coprocessors. So you can add hardware blocks to speed up um, these algorithms. And typically, this is done in the form of an integer multiplier. Uh, an integer multiplier, um, right? So it's just a uh, um, for ETC, we need 256 bit multiplication, uh, let's say. And for RSA, we need much higher uh, bit uh, integer multiplication. So if you have a, a, an integer multiplier, you can uh, um, use it both for RSA and ETC. Um, and so the question that, that comes up is um, suppose we want to run post quantum crypto now on devices that already exist. Um, can we reuse these hardware blocks that were not designed? For these algorithms per se, um, but can we still reuse them to, to gain some efficiency? Um, and so this is a very interesting research direction it was started by Albrecht and others, um, and they use a technique called Kronecker substitution, which was already introduced by Kronecker in 1881, um, and it allows to, um, um, yeah, to to improve the efficiency of some of the post quantum algorithms uh, using your your modern day coprocessors. Of course. Um, the goal in the end will be, um, if necessary, um, to design new hardware, specifically for the post-quantum algorithms, especially if we completely migrate away from RSA and ETC. Um, but this will take time. Um, um, it can take years before, um, um, before that will even exist. And so if you want to start trying post-quantum and running post-quantum already today, and, and um, 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 yeah, you're kind of stuck with, with the hardware as it is for a little while. Okay, so maybe let me deviate a little bit towards uh, another standard. So I've talked about uh, a NIST standardization effort that's ongoing right now. Um, there's already another NIST standard, which is already published um, uh, recently, which already um, 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 uh, yeah, defines a method for doing digital signature schemes. So they're called hash-based signature schemes. Um, they're nice in a sense that uh, the, the security assumptions are very uh, low. So if you assume that hashes work, and that they are secure, um, then you can have faith in the security of hash-based signatures as well, uh, which is nice. It's a very minimal assumption to make. Um, the main downside for these, so they're called XMSS or LMS, is that uh, the signer needs to maintain a state. Um, and so the state can be very simple. It's essentially just uh, um, just a counter, um, uh, but not updating the counter one time uh, as a signer can have really disastrous effects on the security of your, of your private key. And um, so really serious care needs to be taken to um, um, yeah, to, to avoid this. Um, okay, and so, yeah, so the main operation, if we, if we think about uh, its application to, uh, let's say, secure boot or secure update, will be that we don't need to actually sign something, uh, but we just need to verify signatures. Um, and here, the main operation is just to compute uh, lots and lots of hashes, so in the order of thousands of hashes to verify um, a signature. And so one also interesting kind of direction um, that, that we and others are looking into is um, these hash-based signatures kind of allow you to trade off uh, uh, signing time versus verification time. And so especially in the embedded domain where you don't really care so much about your signing time, um, so you want to maybe sign one update and uh, push it to many devices, um, you could allow for a very long signing time or um, your signing will be done on a uh, a much more powerful machine, uh, whereas verification will be done many times uh, by much less powerful uh, devices. Um, and so if you can trade off some of the verification time, uh, maybe at the cost of some signing time, there's actually a trade off that is uh, very much worth making. Um, so recent uh, work in this direction shows that um, um, you can really reduce your uh, signature verification time down from um, uh, well, by almost a factor two. So here's in the number of mil millions of cycles. Um, if you have a very small signature generation, less than uh, 10 milliseconds, um, then you'll need about 14 million cycles for signature verification. If you now allow 60 seconds for your signature generation, then you already have the signature verification time. Um, and depending on your use case, you might even allow uh, many more um, uh, seconds uh, for, for your signature generation. 
Okay, so maybe uh, to conclude, um, yeah, for, from our perspective, it's really not, not relevant um, whether quantum computers uh, or when quantum computers are going to appear. Um, post quantum cryptography is here and it's here to stay, it's here to be standardized and it's going to be used uh, really soon. Um, for example, ANSI um, has uh, mentioned recently that um, in the very near future, and they might mandate post-quantum crypto um, next to classical crypto being mandated to, to, uh, to uh, pass certification, um, um, which will really push many uh, um, organizations to, um, to start using it. And so one, one um, kind of um, bad note to leave this on um, is that all of the numbers and, and things I mentioned here is only for unhardened implementations. But when you're, when you're thinking about secure boot, uh, for example, your, your adversaries uh, um, are gonna do much more than just uh, passively listen. They're gonna uh, try to fault, they're gonna try to uh, measure your, your power, your EM. Um, and so to harden all these algorithms against this, uh, it still needs a lot of research, um, but it will make the picture most likely uh, uh, worse. It will, it will uh, only slow them down more and might even increase the, the memory use. Um, but it remains to be seen what exactly uh, the numbers will be. Um, so yeah, so I think I'll conclude there. I'm happy to take any uh, questions if there are any. Thank you, Joost. Um, that was very informative. Um, yet, Jürgen already has a question. Please take the mic. Uh, yeah, um, maybe I've missed that, but uh, how long are keys and signatures that are used for post-quantum crypto? Maybe in comparison with elliptic curves to get an idea? Yeah, so uh, indeed, I don't think I mentioned that. Um, so it depends on which algorithm is going to be used for, for digital signatures. Um, for schemes like LMS and, and some lattice-based signatures, you should think about in the order of a couple of thousands of bytes. Um, so right, so if you, if you think about an elliptic curve signature, it's going to be something like 64 bytes. Um, for these, um, um, many of the post-quantum Finalist, it's going to be in the order of thousands of bytes. But if you talk about Sphinx Plus, it's, it's a very likely to be standardized hash based signature. You can even think about sizes like 16,000 or, or 32,000 uh, bytes. Um, so it depends a bit on your security level um, and uh, on your scheme. Um, but you will be quite far away from, from 64 bytes. Okay, so bad for uh, low data rate networks. Yes, yes, that's why I said your life will be a little bit. Um... <laughs> yeah, thank you. Are there any more questions? None in the chat. So I think this is something that we'll all just have to process for some time. Because to I think to, to many of this is this new, so um, thanks again. Mm -hmm. um,